Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and this afternoon I'm delighted to be joined by our resident wordsmith, Tony Haggerty, as well as one of Scottish football's rising stars, Amy Canavan. And we're here, obviously, to talk all things Celtic. For a few weeks now, it's been Happy Mondays, Amy. Happy Mondays. And she's brought that into our Celtic support and life. And yet another one um, over the weekend, another performance, really just to save saviour. I mean, saver, saver by our saviour. Um, Tony Haggerty goes on about rip-roaring, free-scoring, never boring. Have we finally got that with this football club, Amy? Yeah, it's relentless, ruthless, remorseful. It really is. Um, it's tantalising stuff. You know, yesterday's probably the most complete because it's been the most dominant for the full 90. Um, I think Kev Graham perhaps highlighted five minutes in the first half and five minutes in the second half. But even then, it was a let-off, but it was still at Celtic's tempo. You know, Motherwell never had a sniff in. Um, if it wasn't for Liam Kelly, who I do believe and have believed for so long should be Scotland's number next number one, you know, um, in goals, uh, the the Marshall, Gordon, McGregor era, that's over. Kelly should have, to be honest, for me, been bled in um, for this period because I just think he's he's an outstanding goalkeeper and he's saved Motherwell's skin and has done time and time again for so mm. many times against Celtic, but against anyone, you know, um, Motherwell are where they are um, in a, in a good place, so much due to, to Liam Kelly because he's, he's so streets ahead of most of the players within that side. So if it wasn't for him, you know, that's four gone on seven or eight. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's not a joke. That's just a, a matter of fact. It was so, so dominant. It's a joy to watch. Some of it is, it is poetic. Um, and you're, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be able to be done um, pretty much against one of the better teams in the league. I fear in the next few weeks, um, somebody's going to get an absolute doing. And I mean a doing, because that's a doing. But for totally and utterly, you know, it, it makes, it flatters me well, it really does. Um, that is as good as a performance, especially to do it on the back. And I think that's what Tom Rogic and Ange came out and said after the game. You know, everybody was kind of looking at us, seeing what what kind of response, what where we would go. Um, but any doubts um, or anyone just trying to, or wanting to catch Celtic out, um, you know, they can, they can stick that in their pipe and smoke it. Aye, they definitely can. And everybody watching, everybody tuning into the, the Monday Bulletin, get involved in the chat. You're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch and Twitter. Get involved in the chat. What did you make of the selection on Sunday? Uh, how will we line up against Aberdeen? What did you make of Tommy Rogic's comments after the game? And anything else you want to talk about Celtic related? Uh, Tony, we had a manager with a vision when Ange came into Celtic. And he's never swayed from that vision. Every time he's been spoken to, regardless of the results, and I think the point was made over the weekend, even after the Michelin disappointment, and he's spoken to after that game, and he stuck to his vision. You know, he was never at any point going to deviate from that. People wanted him to adapt. People said he had to adapt to the game. Um, and some people said that, you know, he didn't have a plan B. We're sitting here now that he has the personnel and they're playing to his plan. So he's got the... the the players he inherited, along with those he's brought in in the first window, they are basically hit firing on all cylinders. And then he's got the new guys who have hit the ground running. And what we're now seeing is what Ange promised us when he came in. We had done a, a few interviews in the early days, Tony, to try and get an idea of um, Ange's reputation both in Australia and in Japan. And we were told, which was a wee bit worrying, that normally he takes on two-year projects in that it's year two when you see it in full, you know, throttle. I think we're seeing it just now. I mean, Ange might tell us we're not. Ange is might maybe telling us we're only at seventy-five percent. I don't know. But what Amy said there about Motherwell, that could, and we said it on Wednesday night, that could have been six going on seven. And this is us playing a team that's in the top four, and we've gone to their park and we've played them off the park. You were there, Tony. What was your thoughts overall? Well, another happy Monday. They're going to step on you again. <laughs> That's twice in a row. Now, someone put up a meme. Last season, somebody was twisting our melons, but this season yeah. is completely yeah. different. Right. And uh, <laughs> someone said that that's the best Celtic performance I've seen since, since 72 hours. You know what I mean? So, uh, which I thought was very clever. That's fair enough, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just, 
I mean, they dismantled Rangers in the first half at Celtic Park and then did the same again to Motherwell. They dismantled them. See the difference, what happens when they score three in the first half? Two is always precarious, isn't it? Or maybe not score. They score one or, you know, they miss a half. But see when they actually win the game in the first half, they go three and easy. Mm-hmm. And then you can relax. And you can see things that are happening. You know, it's no surprise. I think Anne's told you himself, and sought counsel from one of the best people we've ever called Planet Football, Ferns Puskas. Right? And he told you back in October, this guy, he revered this guy. And Ferns Puskas played in a team, you know, the Hungarian, the, the Galloping Major, he's named the Magical Magyars. You know, and only because of a lack of TV exposure, you, you don't know, know too much about them. But Ferns Puskas is one of the best footballers this world's ever created. Mm-hmm. You know, and he told Ange the only way to play football is to entertain and score goals. <laughs> now, if someone like Ferns Puskas is telling you that, he's taking that on board. And that's the way Ange plays his football. And he ain't going to deviate from it. And if you, and for those of an older generation and vintage, you can see that 1960 Real Madrid Eintracht Frankfurt game at Hamnium with Ferns Puskas and Alfredo Di Stefano both score all the goals, right? <laughs> But there's a goal that's scored. Eintracht Frankfurt score. And they placed the ball down. Real Madrid placed the ball down for centre. And Ferns Puskas and uh, Di Stefano have a chat. And Puskas gives Di Stefano the ball. And he runs for about 20 yards. And from about 35, 40 yards, rattles it into the bottom corner. It's the only way Ferns Puskas and that team knew how to play. Attack, 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 entertain, score. If you can't score, then at least make the goalkeeper work, create chances. Angie's hasn't apologised for that. The last couple of performances, as Amy said, they've been pretty relentless, haven't they? Yet this is a manager who, after those games and telling you all season, they're going to get better. I'd love to see Celtic when they're better. I can't wait till he gets all those players fit and he has that plethora of options. That's a hard call. Who are you going to play, on? Yeah. You know, and if this team's going to get better, then, you know, you're in for some ride for as long as he's here, for as long as he stays as Celtic manager. Because I don't think that... Uh, I think the last two games have uh, put, and I'll say, a pure unadulterated joy in the Celtic supporters' faces just for the manner and style and the way they've dismantled the opposition. And Amy says somebody could cop it if it all falls into place, and they do, and they become even more ruthless. But they've just made you really smile watching them. Not just the goals they've scored and the way they've scored them, but the actual football that they've played, the way things are falling into place. I mean, two fullbacks set up goals yesterday. Mm-hmm. They played, played killer passes. We'll come to that. You know, so you try to tell me that everybody in that team doesn't know their role. That's a strong team. That's a team working in harmony, listening to the manager and all performing their function and their role in that team. They all know what to do. That it's now second nature. Tony Ralston made a, a really pertinent comment yesterday when we spoke to him. He said the inverted fullback system's not alien to me anymore. Note the choice of phrase. It's not alien. He's comfortable with it. Yeah. Maybe what maybe wasn't at first, but this this now now they're interchanging. They can bring in. Ralston for Juranovic, they can bring in, uh, they can drop O'Reilly, bring in Rodjick. O'Reilly comes on, still plays a good part. You no, know, they left Jot out as well. It's what he's been craving all season. And you know, it's uh, strap yourself in. What an exciting title race it's going to be. But Celtic are a bit of swashbuckling about them at the minute. It's no arrogance. You know, it's they're swashbuckling. And there's a feel good factor in there. You know, and these guys are now performing to the to the best of their ability, aided by a manager who's now shown you what he's got. Well, you mentioned Ferrets Puskas. We've already spoken about the Happy Mondays, Tony. Who knows what else is going to be brought up? <laughs> but the Puskas, I love the Puskas element. Um, obviously, we had Kevin McCluskey, uh, who is based in Budapest. He was one of the contributors to the show yesterday. We had a wee chat um, after the game about that particular element. Of course, Puskas was part of that great Hungarian side who made it to the World Cup final in 1954. And the Celtic side at that point 
which was your Neely Mocking, Willie Fernie, Sean Farland, Bobby Collins, Bertie Peacock, Jock Steen, etc. Um, they had won the double, 53-54. So the board of directors decided as a treat that they would take them along to the World Cup final um, tournament in 1954 because four Celts were actually representing Scotland. And let me get this right. Was it Neely Mocking? I think Willie Fernie, Bobby Evans, Bobby Collins. I think that was the four Celts that were in the, the Scotland squad. But the rest of the squad were just to watch the games. And, you know, footballers do what footballers do. But Jock's team was already sitting there at the games taking notes. He's watching the Hungarian side. He's watching what became known before the Dutch coined the phrase total football yeah, yeah, and the, yeah. the, the total, total football he was watching Tony in part was implemented by Jimmy Hogan who eventually became a trainer at Celtic but he's watching Puskas who later influences Ange Postacoglu who is now implementing his own style of football which is really the style of football that Celtic are famed for so I love how that all falls into place yeah. when it comes to Celtic um, after the game not deliberately I've got to say um, a few people brought up the fact that we didn't mention Lee Labada enough after yesterday's game. And I'll put my hands up and agree with that because looking back on the performance of Abada in that first half, Amy, he was absolutely superb. Um, you look at the fact, uh, we keep going on about his age, right? 20 years of age, he's a right winger. Um, you know, he scores the opener, he's got two assists, he's now played 38 games. And again, I do keep saying this, imagine a 20-year-old who came into the Celtic side at 19 from the academy, went on to play 38 games. Well, he's, he's played 38 so far. He scored 14. He's had 11 assists, but it looks as though in the last few games, he's hit a purple patch. It's almost as if he's been turbocharged, Amy. Ooh. Are you in any doubt that he is definitely the first choice on the right-hand side over James Forrest at the moment? Oh, there's not a shadow of doubt. He has, you know, he's been outstanding since, especially since after the winter break, he's just not stopped. To have 25 goal contributions in this first season, like you say, if it was an academy player who came through or whatever, we wax and lyrical. Um, and it's embarrassing, I think, looking back and even going, my God, I can't believe I ever criticised them. Um, and I still wouldn't even say it was criticism. It was just, you know almost disappointment more than anything but take all of that away that was um yeah he's, he's totally you know proved me wrong anybody else because he has been absolutely phenomenal but I do feel it has been a different Abada since you know since the new year to probably Abada in September October and I know that's settling in period but um if this is how much you can do the settling in in such still a short space of time um you know he's going to have a, an incredible Celtic career in front of him uh, I worry it might be short because, you know, someday I'll pick him up. You look at age on his side. Um, but <laughs> exactly, Tony. But everything, you know, um, the Ralston ball through for, for the Abada assist for the Rogic goal, everything was just, you know, it, it's stunning stuff. The time the run from Hitati, it's, you know, it's poetry in motion. It really is. And he, he's been he's been a joy to watch. And I feel he's got that bit of confidence in him. Um mm now as well I think what does help and I know this is kind of well it didn't happen yesterday but I think since the new year having Juranovic behind him has really helped as well but if you look at yesterday with the ball through from Ralston it doesn't really matter who is behind him but I would say because there's that there's always overlap with Juranovic um, and we all know like I say I'm still Tony Ralston's biggest fan who I thought was outstanding yesterday as well you know he'll he's gonna be dropped because Juranovic is just number one but you think you know that guy doesn't deserve to be dropped um, but so the competition is there through. But going back to Abada, um, yeah, if that Forrest, if you know James Forrest coming back was to give him a little bit of kick up the backside, well, it's kicked him into a whole new, whole new <laughs> level. Um, and yeah, it really is a, a joy to watch. It is, Amy, and I'm glad you picked up on Ralston because uh, I'm also a member of your Tony Ralston fan club, and it's good to see him coming in and getting a game because you need to keep. I've seen this at the weekend. Someone suggested Ange doesn't have a first 11. You know, I, I would maybe subscribe to that. People are going to say, well, Zhiranovic is your first choice right back. Yeah, he is. He is your first choice right back. But he's not going to be playing every week. And I think that was a point that was made. There's going to be a rotation with certain positions. And Abada, 19 going on 20, Tony, you would sometimes think, oh, he's played a bit of football. He's played a wee bit too much. He played a lot of football before he came to Celtic as well. But 38 games in, 
Uh, some suggest he's, he, he might be better through the middle. But when you see these performances, there's a moment where he's sitting on the billboards watching the ball that he's played get finished and get put in the net. It's a great image. And he seems c- quite humble. I know that in his original press conference, we were at um, his press conference, Axel, we at that one. Um, he spoke about, and again, sometimes it might be words getting put in his mouth. He spoke about his next step in his career. I don't want to think about that. I want to see Jota down the left, Abada down the right, Kyogo through the middle. I want to see Roderick hitting form or right. I want everybody, Hitati, let's not forget, all hitting form at the same time. We've not seen that yet. And what a, you know, what a team it's going to be uh, when we do see it. When you look at Abada, the way he's developed, Tony, um, I think he came into the game all guns blazing for Celtic. There was a dip, you would expect that, but he's then, I think he, he's he's probably bettered his early performances in the last few weeks. Yeah, I'm going to big up young Ryan McGinley, who put out a tweet last night. He borrowed a phrase that I used about Ryan Christie and David Tumble last season, but he tweaked it for Abada and said, Lyle Abada is the player the Rangers fans think Ryan Kent is, which I quite liked. So, well done, Ryan. Neat Fair twist. enough, Ryan. Good neat, shout. Neat, neat twist on the uh, David Tumble, was a player Ryan Christie thinks he is, but uh, some variation on a similar theme. So, nice one, Ryan. But, yeah, I mean, 14 goals and 11 assists. I don't care his age. 20, 21, 25, 38, it don't matter. From a wide player, that's magnificent. And yet, people still dispute whether he's a winger or he's a centre-forward. doesn't really matter. (laughs) He's got an eye for goal and he can create. And this is a guy who did have a trough during the season and people were saying, get James Forrest back in. You know, so as Amy said, whatever's happened or whatever's been said, he's realised with Forrest coming back in, he knows the bar and the height that he has to reach. And my goodness, he's reaching it. And again, another player who's happy to play on the right or play through the middle. Just just get him functioning and playing. And he's pretty potent. I mean, the ball from Hitati makes that goal. Well, actually, the ball from Taylor makes the goal yesterday. Taylor's pass to Hattati is brilliant. Absolutely is that you talk, are you talking about secondary assists there, Tony? Well, I'm talking about, yes, secondary assists. Call it what you like. <laughs> Passages of play, whatever. First play, second play, whatever. But right, Taylor's ball to Hattati just opens it all up, right? Yeah. Hattati's ball across is just, it's a thing of beauty. But Abad has read it again, but very similar to his goal the other night. He's just ran off his man. But the finish, he makes it look so easy, but it's the hardest thing to do. How many times have guys skied that, got their feet, uh, can't adjust their feet, made a mess of it, hit the goalkeeper? But the minute you saw him running onto that, you were like, 1-0. Well, I know I was. I was sitting in the, the press box. I was like, he's made that look easy. You know, so, and this is a guy, purple patch, top of his game, who's just responding to what the manager's telling him. And clearly, when he had that wee dip, took time to kind of... Just, uh, you know, cool, calm his jets and think, right, OK, what do I need to do to get back in? Once I'm back in, I'm going to make the manager's job a hard one to put me back out. And he certainly is. Because, as you say, moving forward, you are excited about Jota on the left, Abad mm-hmm. on the right, Kyogo through the middle, or Kyogo, Jack and Marcus, Maida, per many, one from three. But it's just so good to be talking about options, isn't it? And that word again, a plethora of them. It's been denied the manager up until this point, but he's stressed that they would always come good. And he stressed that being from Australia and the way Australian football works, they always they always have a grand final at the end of the season. Yeah. This team start to peak, come now and right through to the end. So if this is Celtic hitting their stride and then they're going to peak when the trophies are handed out, then they'll be in the mix and I'll include being in the mix for the European one as well. Because he ain't happy just domestically. He wants to make his name in Europe. He was saying that at the weekend too, that Mm -hmm. he wants to make Celtic a team renowned for their football and people speaking about their football. So, yeah, if that doesn't tell you that he's got his eyes on bigger pictures and these players are coming in not to leave after a year, let's be frank, he's building something. You know, I think he wants to build some kind of legacy at Celtic. Not won't speculate as to how long you'll be here for but it ain't going to be a year 
No, no, you're right. And and I think that um, you were talking there about how he ghosted Abada, how he ghosted in, in to get the ball. And, you know, last season, Amy, Twitter wasn't a very nice place to be. Uh, this season, however, there's been a lot of the humour coming back into the old um, Celtic fan base, which I love to see. And there was a few things all about uh, the weekend that uh, and the Rangers game that you couldn't have escaped, really. The first one was that bizarre animation. Don't know who was uh, <laughs> responsible for it, but uh, it really captured you know, the way that Abada was able to ghost in at the back post, creeping about at the back post. And then somebody posted a picture of an owl walking on its legs. I don't know if you've ever seen an owl. It creeps about as if it's about to rob your house, right? And that's Abada. And then, of course, there was the Fitbar Tweets uh, graphics. And honestly, I'm amazed at the creativity and the productivity of all these people online, but it keeps us smiling. And I think what you were saying there about um, Abada, there's going to come times this season, this is it, there's going to, there's going to be occasions this season where he does hit few, a few troughs again. And that's when you're looking at James A. Forrest, the experience A. Forrest, to come back in um, to reclaim his jersey. And, you know, that that is great competition. Uh, for Ange Postacoglu to have. I'm keen to get as many comments up as possible. There's a lot of people getting involved, over a thousand watching live. Thank you all for supporting Axon. Wayne Jackson, hail, hail people. Isn't it great to be a boy? Yeah, and a girl, Amy, and a girl. Paddy Burns, good afternoon to the best fans in the world. See this positivity, I can get used to this. And Michael McDonald, another happy Monday, I could get used to this. Ah, you too, Michael, absolutely. There's also some tremendous points coming through um, about our man Tommy Roger KT nineteen sixty seven. We have been top for a decade. Class from the wizard. Well, we were actually talking. I think it was last week. Someone told us that Tommy Roger hates doing press. Um, <laughs> at some point in the season, somebody told us that. Can't remember who it was. And then he pops up after that game, and it stopped me in my tracks because it's very unusual, Amy, to see the big gorgeous Tam in front of the camera. Um, but I tell you what, he's got a bit of the Angie boot on me. If, he, if he's answering the question. There's, um, aye, not and by no means an arrogance, not whatsoever, but there's a, a wee bit of, like, no messing. And I uh -huh. like it. I um, mm. get straight to the fact he doesn't waffle on. Um, he addresses what he wants to address, will say what all he wants to say, won't be forced into saying anything else. Um, but he knew exactly what he was going to say. Um, and he, he timed it to perfection. It's went down an absolute treat, and, and rightly so. Did the man lie? He never. Um, and, yeah, there was a mate at the end as well. So, you know, cook him with gas. Yeah, there was that mate, Tony. I actually don't think that he was trolling anybody. I think no. he was making a serious point that he's one of the more experienced players that's used to being the top of the table. I think the, the kind of suggestion or the inference in the question was, you know, will, will you be able to sustain it type of thing? And he's like, listen, I've been in a dressing room where Guys have been top for 10 years. Callum McGregor's been top for 10 years. Joe Hart's been at the top. You know, so it's like the second nature to them. It wasn't a troll and MDN, and it wasn't a dig at, at Rangers per se. It was just a kind of, look, I'm used to this. I can handle it. You know, and the other guys are, are good enough and technical, you no know, technical ability enough, and have shown that they're good enough, they'll be able to handle it. So I think it was just a wee kind of, well, yeah, we'll fuck the front, but you know, we're used we're used to this being in this position. Mm -hmm. Why all of a sudden is it something that we should be worried about or scared of, you know, or, or think that, you know, are you trying to infer that we might blow it? I think he was sort of saying, We've got a temperament for it. Don't annoy me. We've been here for ten years. You know, we'll reconvene in May. You know, and I think that's what the manager's saying. It's not about being top now, it's about being top in May, obviously. And I think Roger was kinda of like, Well, We've been top, you know, I've got the medals to show, you know, I'll, I'll see you later type thing. Just remind people that, yeah, they had one blip, they had a bad season last season. But he addressed that as well. He said that we had a bad season, fine. We're back on top. No, we'll take we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. The guys himself will help take it from there because I've been over the course and distance. It's not something new to me. It's not something new to guys in this dressing room. You know, right? You know, because even the the a couple of the Japanese players that have come in, they've won titles as well. So it's it's you, it doesn't matter where you win a league. You know, if you can prove you're the best team in your league, then 
You know, it's all part of the, the experience that Andy's brought into this team and building a team that he thinks, as you say, it was usually people told us it was the second year. But you don't think for a minute that Ange thinks he can win the title this season? And he's not telling his players that? And he's not telling his players that he can win all three that are left, i.e. including the Europa Conference League? Indoors, Celtic will probably think that. Outwardly, it'll be the game at a time stuff. Mm-hmm. But Yuri's thinking, let's have a right tilt at this. Why not? We are good enough. Let's see what it takes us. Absolutely, Tony. And I said at the weekend there, um, I think that despite what he walked into, he probably believed himself. He seems that type of guy, that character, that personality with, with the amount of um, self-belief that he probably believed, even with the circumstances he inherited back then, that he could do um, what you just said there and win the league. He kind of signposted it, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know. He kept telling us, wait till later on in the season. Yeah, come back to me, aye. Once I've got everything in order here. Now, Tommy Roderick, like you say, he's talking about we've been on top for 10 years. Um, he's now in his 10th season at Celtic. He's in his 10th season at Celtic. I will be going to his testimonial. It's on 29 in December. He's a Sagittarius. Don't know if you're into that. And uh, I only know that because he was born the day after me. Cost, although probably about 20 years afterwards, cost us just over 400 grand. Just over four. Now, people talk about bargains and snips he's making that 400 grand look like one of the bargains of modern times and we signed him from central coast mariners um as i say way back almost a decade ago he was in and out of the team amy under neil lennon i mean he wasn't one of the first names on the on the team sheet but when you look at this season this is an, an interesting thing just looking at his his appearances this morning he's made 30 appearances this season right now, this is a player that apparently can only play for 60 minutes. And he has completed 90 minutes on 11 occasions. So more than a third of his games have been the full 90 minutes, right? Um, he's played 30 games. The most he's ever played for Celtic in a, in a season is 42. He's well on the way to beating that. And here we go. This is the one that I found interesting. Yesterday was his sixth 90 minutes in a row for Celtic. Now, I know there was the three games he missed whilst on international duty, but that's six games in a row that he's played the full 90. So he's dispelled that myth. He's looking, Amy, as fit as he's ever looked in a Celtic jersey. Um, and you're still asking yourself, right, he's a first pick, but what do we do with O'Reilly? What do we do with O'Reilly on Wednesday night? Um, I, I really don't know. It's some headache to have. Um, I think he's find a way that just uh, is crazy, you know, because neither of them deserve to be dropped um, like whatsoever. Rogic was absolutely out of this world yesterday. He's looking so lean. Mm. It looks like he's, his knee and his ankle injuries are almost behind him, touch wood. Um, but he's looking so, so fit. Um, and he's just gliding like I've always thought that he glides but this is just this is a new this is like a new version it's a total he, he always he opens his body up to show the ball yeah. to his opponent it's not it's not real um and then glides past him exactly the stuff that he can do with the ball his feet is it's out of this world it seriously is i did i've made many mistakes here but it's one thing i did always say that I should never ever have let him go in the summer like that would have been a travesty if celtic did um and i'm obviously so glad that they never but it, I, it's a it's a whole new level right now, and but you look at O'Reilly came on, you know, it was a cameo appearance um, yesterday, but he was still you know one of the best players on the park. His through ball um, was outstanding, like that is, oh, uh, it's just pitch perfect. It really is. Um, there's there's not really a, enough to describe it. You've just got to watch. Um, like I say, find a way to play them both. Probably uh, not going to happen, but it's being greedy in it, Tony. Yeah, well, that's not normally being greedy as a football fan, is it? When you saw Riley's through ball, what did you think? You thought, what about Kyogo coming back into that team and running onto those yeah. guys? That's the first thing you thought. You thought O'Reilly could set him up. My God, how many times a game. But Roger, do you know what I loved about Roger yesterday? See that non celebration when he scored the second goal? Just like, what, what's, is that, it, what's that, that smile? I know. <laughs> It was the same when Hatati the other night when he bent the second one and it was like, why are you all, what's the surprise here? This is what I do. I'm a good footballer. I'll show you. But Rodgers was like that and it was like, Lubos, remember? 
when he scored in the five one game, just kinda mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is what I do. This is who I am. This is the kind of football I am. I mean, did you have any doubt where that ball was going when Abada laid it back to him? As soon as it left his foot, Kevin Graham cheered. Yeah. As soon, uh, I, I'm telling you, as soon as he struck that yeah. ball, yeah. we knew it was going in. There was an air of inevitability about it, wasn't there? Because mm-hmm. you've seen him do it so many times and he makes it look so easy. And I've said on this, and I've said it before, had Rodgick left at the end in the summer, not a lot of Celtic supporters would have batted an eyelid, right? Because of what had happened. And I've said before that you... He has some sublime moments in a Celtic jersey, Tom Rogic. Great goals. But I said about the DVD thing and all that, but not his greatest games. Now, every game this season from Tom Rogic is probably his greatest game because he's just getting better and better and better. And this is clearly a manager who has known how to play him and has got into his head that, you know, it's not enough, Tom, just to produce the odd great moment. You have to be consistent. You have to be fit. Why were other managers only giving you 60 minutes? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? I'll trust you. I know the player you are, but you've got to to help me. You can't just produce a howitzer every now and again and think that will carry you. You said, what, six, 90 minutes in a row? Mm-hmm. That's a, no other manager has done that with Tom Rogic. I, I bet you're right. I bet you're right. I, I've not checked, but I bet you that's the first time he's right. played 90 oh. minutes. Yep. Six times. This, this thing about Tom Rogic, he was unfit. Mm-hmm. He couldn't last. You know, and it even permeated into the supporters. You know, or that'd be it, Tom Rogic. And then you saw his face sometimes when he was taken off. We all knew he had ability, but it needed, I've stressed earlier this season, it needed to marry the sum of the parts together. And my goodness, he's done that this season under a manager whom he's known. And it's no surprise, is it, that it's Ange that's got that tune out of him? Because he knows him. And Ange is a good football manager, but he's also a good man manager, clearly. And he said to Tom Rodgers, you could be the best player in this football team. You know, listen to me, do this and that. And then I'll let you know. I'll let the rest of your natural ability take over. Mm-hmm. I mean, he went away for three games and came back yesterday. He thought he'd never been away. I mean, it was seamless. And then O'Reilly comes on, and you're thinking, "Oh man, we've got some really seriously talented football players in our club." You know my thoughts on that. I'm like you, Amy. You should horn them in. Can't get enough good players in your team. But he's he's adamant he'll play the four three three, isn't he? So. It's, uh, but again, then do you make, do you give one of them license to roam forward and support, you know, Kyogo, Jota, whoever? Because I, I like O'Reilly. I think O'Reilly's a, a baller. He's fantastic. Know. See, you see when you're talking there about Tommy Rogic, I think the reason he never celebrated because he would just try to keep his energy. You know, it's like, I'm not going to waste <laughs> it on a celebration. I'll just give you a wee smile. You all know what I can do. But you know, go to Aberdeen what, Wednesday. I'll save it for I, that. I'll save it for that. But see, when you think back to last season, and I know people will be saying, no, let's forget last season, but there was a moment, and I think it was against Livingston, and there was a moment where we had a throw-in, and David Turnbull, Ryan Christie, and Tom Rogic were all on the park, and they were all standing within about five yards of each other. So you had three number 10s, basically, all standing there, all wanting the ball, and you kind of looked at that and thought, there's no game plan here. We're not utilising either of those three talents in the right way. And you look at where Tommy Rodgers' career was going at that stage and, and beyond there. So there's a four and a half million pound, I think, bid from Qatar. And he's going to go. And Celtic as a club would have been looking at that situation and saying, well, we've made 10 times the money we paid for him. That's good business. We can use that as an example of how we actually have a transfer strategy. They'd have sold him. Um, personal terms couldn't be agreed. He comes back. And he has shown us that right now, at this moment in time, there isn't a Celtic fan out there who would take £4.5 million for Tom Rogic. The guy is uh, an absolute genius. Um, This time last summer, Tony, you mentioned uh, where he was last summer. He was left at home with Lee Griffiths to get fit. If you'll remember, we went to France and he was one of the players, I think there was four players, left at home because he wasn't fit enough. Look at him now. Look at how he's playing. I want, honestly, I want Mogwai to do that soundtrack that they did with Zidane. There was a, there was a documentary made in 2006 of Zidane. What was that? 21st 
uh, century portrait of a footballer. I want Tommy Rogic to be the star of the uh, sequel to that. That's how good he is. And I want Mogwai to soundtrack it. So if you can sort that out, guys, that would be tremendous. Well, you've got plenty of moments, Paul, for it. Exactly. Well, the, the, the key so, is just follow know. him for 90 minutes. <laughs> just, you know, 90 minutes. Not 60, 90. <laughs> 90 minutes, yeah. And uh, Mogwai will, I hope it isn't a 60 minute film. They can soundtrack it for us, right? But Tommy Roderick, absolutely outrageous. Now, we spoke also yesterday about strength in numbers and strength on the bench. Something that Ange Postacog has not had all season. People were asking, they were asking questions, Amy, um, about the second half drop off. And I mean, it's just a theory. Is it down to the fact that he didn't quite have the the um, amount of energy on the bench, the talent on the bench that he needs? And now we're getting to that point. We're going to see the 90 minutes of Ange Postacog, not just 45 or 65 minutes. Do you think it's as simple as that, Amy? I don't think it's necessarily as simple as that, but I think that plays a massive part in it. You know, um, it's not an 11 man game anymore. You know, it is 16, and I think Angie said it before the 11 that you end with, somebody said it yesterday, 11 you end with is just as important as the 11 you start with. Um, and it is when you've got the players that Celtic have at their disposal right now, the fact that the third and the fourth substitution yesterday was uh, Yota and O'Reilly, that's incredible you know it is absolutely mental you're sitting there going that is crazy um and the five substitutions i know i think a lot of us it was you know it's change and nobody especially nobody in football really likes change so it was weird to see it but especially now and it's obviously it's kind of glory hunter status but when you've got a decent squad um and you've got the players there then five substitutions it's only going to improve Celtic. It is, it's mental that like say you can bring bring them on as the third and fourth that calibre of player who fit into any other starting eleven in the country without a shadow of a doubt probably the first names on, on any other team um, so yeah it definitely does help because the rotation the fitness levels everything's just there um, you're getting you know 60-70 minutes solid out of Yakimakis, who yesterday I thought was absolutely outstanding, like absolutely outstanding. I thought it was one of his best games, and I hope, I hope we get to to touch on him. But you know, you're even you're bringing Juranovic off the bench, like the guy's outstanding. He was the best player probably on on Wednesday night. I know mm. Tati obviously got man of the match, but it's not even an unpopular opinion because so many people are saying it. But Juranovic, if it wasn't for Hatati getting two goals, he he absolutely strolled it. You know, his intensity levels are. Are amazing and even the, the credit there really to Ralston that he got kept on and it was you know Taylor that came off at Juranovic just what we're talking about like fluidity that you know Abada can play on the wing or through the middle Juranovic can play on either flank you know you can have Hatati in the, the 10 or he can sit that a little bit deeper as well just the way that Celtic have so many players for so many positions um, is only going to aid and you know ensure that this intensity that has always been there this season for the the well, certainly for the last few months, the opening 45, even more so since the winter break. But to continue that for the first time, you know, into the second half and throughout the second half, which Celtic done yesterday, um, was, you know, that that is only is only going to happen more and more, I feel. Well, you're right in what you say. It's, it's part of the reason, I guess, Amy, the fact that we can keep the intensity up. But also, Tony, do you reckon it's the fact that the players who have already been there and those who came in in the first transfer window are now at that stage. We spoke about Jurgen Klopp's first season at Liverpool. There was a turning point around about the Christmas time into the new year where the, the players' bodies had adapted to the intensity of the games and also the training. So do you think it's a combination of the fact that those who were here before um, are, are obviously clicking in in terms of the physicality of Angie's regime and then we're complementing and supplementing them with the new signings who are obviously of a higher standard than what we, we maybe had before. I mean, I touched upon it earlier about Ralston saying that the plane, the kind of uh, inverted fullback, wasn't alien to him, you know. But I think he was making a wider point that none of this is alien to any of the players anymore. Mm -hmm. you no, know, they're all, they're all, they've all bought in. They're all on in and Ange. The players are all on and Ange. The fans are all on and Ange. But you know the. They understand now what their roles are in the team. They actual they actually hate being out the team, but they know fine well what their remit is when they get back in. Like Ralston played yesterday as if he, he hadn't been out the team. You know, there was no ring rustiness there with Ralston. You know, when the players that miss out for a few games, you think come in, take a while to adjust. Nah, 
didn't take a while to adjust. He was bang at, bang at it from the, the get-go. And as I say, his wonderful pass that released a badder. Not many times has he done that this season. He did it in Betis as well, didn't he? Mm. It was uh, a crack, cracking pass. Aye. Or, or Alkmaar, one of the games, or two of the games, in fact, possibly. So, you know, it's something that he just knows. And he, and he was talking about when the way Celtic player, the fullback, uh, you know, gives him that option, he's going to look for that pass. So that's clearly something that he's been told. The fullback moves, a badder gets a bit of space, hit it into that area, he'll get it. You know, so that's something that's been drilled into him. You know, I'm using Ralston as an example, but there'll be other things that's been drilled into the players by Ange that, that it's now second nature. And as you say, they now have a quality of player to execute the manager's game plan. Whereas earlier in the season, we, we, we neither had the quality of the player and the game plan was possibly alien to them because they were like, OK, and and the managers kept saying, we'll, we'll persevere with it, we'll stick mm-hmm. with it. We'll stick with it till it does become something that you do in your sleep, till it becomes something that you don't even think about anymore. You just do it. And I think the last two games, you witnessed that, haven't you? That high intensity, that fluidity, that relentlessness, that swashbuckling style that Celtic have played, and it's it's came to fruition because they've scored three goals in the first half, every one of them a cracking goal. Uh, and you look at it and you think, yeah, they they can play like that the way Ange wants them to play, and they can they can be successful playing that way. And then as I get back to the manager, says, "Yeah, we're getting there. We're not the finished article. We're we're going to get better." So when it becomes better and it is as slick as it is, then as Amy said at the top of the program, somebody's going to take a hiding, and I mean a real hiding. I mean that was a that was a scudding yesterday, but there's going to be a a seven eight, isn't there? I hope so. Possibly before the end of the season. You know, so I hope it's, I hope it's against Wraith Rovers. Um on that note. <laughs> Stevie Kenny getting in on the action. Step on. Absolutely, Stevie. <laughs> uh we're getting a good afternoon from Monte. Uh Feed the Bear, welcome back. I hope you're well. Feed the Bear, Ryan Kelly, it's all positive. Loving the sound of this. Uh, McGrory starting to put games to bed. That's what we're talking about, McGrory. How are we starting to do it? I think there's a combination of things coming into play now. Urban Kulshi points out uh, the, the fact that we don't have the coverage of the game on Wednesday. Is it on Red TV, is it, Amy? Are we going to have to pay well, for this? Is it a PPV? Like that. Uh, it's a free I'm... Scottish Premiership card and there's not a single game, so it's an absolutely terrific deal that the SPFL has struck up with Sky. Um, that's a disgrace. Like I say, full card, not a single game on the telly. Yeah, it is not the best, um, but really it wasn't the best that we had to suffer Chris Boyd at the weekend again on Sky Sports. Michael Stewart has got an issue with a song played at a kit launch and he is he's sidelined by the BBC almost immediately. I remember the furore in October. Um, Chris Boyd wants people to test Callum McGregor's mask. But it's all right, just be Boyd, go back on the telly, that's fine. An absolute nonsense. Now, Cameron Carter-Vickers, I could say it every week. The guy is an absolute... I'm (laughs) telling you what, he is a keystone in this team, isn't he? I mean, we know what Joe Hart can do behind him, but he is an element of this side that I think sometimes you can take him for granted um, due to the fact that he's quietly effective a lot of the time. But the question for me is, uh, obviously, Ange was was asked the question about the low knees. He says, listen, uh, both Jota and Cameron Carter-Vickers are bought into the club which is tremendous to hear. And we're working away in the background. Michael Nicholson's working away in the background to get the deals done. I want both of them done. That would be fantastic in the summer. But I ask myself, where does it leave Welsh? Well, Welsh is back up. We know that. And I think he knows that as well. I mean, he's, he's developed really well, Stephen Welsh. I'm a big fan. But he's back up to Starfelt and Carter Vickers. Where does it leave Julian? He's been out the squad for the last two games. Um, and I'm starting to look at that scenario, not to try and paint any kind of negative because he's not in the team anyway. I was thinking Julian comes in, it gives us one of the dilemmas that we're having all over the park, but he's dropped back out. Do you have any concerns about Julian? What does the future hold, do you think? It is a funny one. Um, like you say, I'm, I'm dropping back out. You think that when you can make so many substitutes as well, you know, Celtic bench is, is bigger than ever. Um, there's a few times that you just think, where is he? So it's a worry. You hope that nothing's really, nothing's been said otherwise to the contrary. So you can't assume that there's been another niggle, but it would appear that there's almost been a hilt in the recovery. Um, mm. 
And it's a worry because, you know, Celtic did spend an awful lot of money on him for Celtic standards, especially on a defender. Um, I think the majority of us really do like him. Uh, it's tricky right now because obviously Starfelt and, and uh, Carter Vickers have built up that relationship. You can't just say because Julian was our best defender. Don't I don't I, to be honest? I doubt that he still is. I think Carter Vickers is streets ahead of anybody right now. I think he's unbelievable. But you don't know. You can't you know talk about a, a Carter Vickers and Julian partnership. Perhaps that's what we would all think because. Certainly, the Julian before was better, I think, than what we are seeing from Starfelt still. Um, and you think there'd be a little bit of solidity, solidity at the back, sorry. Um, but yeah, the, the the longer it goes, the, and the longer it goes on, Starfelt and Carter Vickers, they're just going to, you know, build up a, an even greater partnership, and it's not going to drop him at the drop of a hat when he's, you know, protecting one of the the sort of well the best defensive league in the country as well. So it is, it's an iffy one. Um I hope that he does still have a Celtic future because I do really like him. I think he's possessed a lot of great qualities, you know, captaincy qualities as well. Um, you know, I think he's got real, real leadership and I would like to see him with Carter Vickers because I think that could be a real solid partnership. But at the same time, you know, he can't just waltz back into a side. Um even though going by, you know, it sounds like it feels an eternity since he last played for Celtic. Um, what the performances that he was putting in then, I do still believe are, are better than what Starfield puts in right now. But it's a, it's a really odd one because you'd be thinking right now when games are getting seen out, you know, like I say, Wraith and just uh, well, Wraith this weekend, actually, um, you'd be looking at that kind of game probably for him. Um, as a mark or even to try and get back for, but when you've not been, you know, like you say, even in the match day squad for the last few weeks, it's um, it's a tricky one. Mm. I'm pretty sure that uh, when Tony gets the opportunity, he'll ask the gaffer. We'll be talking to Tony about his experience with Ange last week. But but Tony, you know, when I look at the side, it's evolving like like we've said today. We're talking about having at least two players who can fit in just about every position, but there are some figures in that squad that when fit will play, Joe Hart, Callum McGregor, Cameron Carter-Vickers, mm, Tommy Rogic, possibly even Starfelt. Now that might be a wee bit controversial, but as a partnership, that you three know, at the back picks itself at the moment. Do you know where, where, where does that leave Julianne for you, Tony? Well, Julianne's going to have to work hard to get back into the side. Mm. Cameron Carter-Vickers and Starfelt, Carol Starfelt are now a real potent central defensive pairing. Last two, the last few games, they've coped with anything. And there's been different challenges, and you know, Starfield gets a, a tough time. But I think, uh, I think aided and abetted by Carter Vickers, the two of them are really, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, someone posted to me the, the other day and said, uh, "What was it? <laughs> Cameron carpet slippers." They were calling him, you know, and I thought that, that's marvellous. Uh, Cameron and Carpet Slippers. You know, he, he, he's just taken to Scottish football like a duck to water. He, he's unflappable. Mm -hmm. I've, not, I've not seen him being bullied or boss. Maybe in Europe the standards are a bit better and, you know, but that's that everybody gets uh, tested. Uh, their metal gets tested in Europe. So, But again, he's on a steep learning curve too. But certainly in Scotland, he's coped with everything that's been flung at him so far. And Starfelt, yeah, Starfelt, people just, they, they, they pick up on Starfelt's wobbles. Is he cumbersome on the ball? Yeah. Does he do something in a game where you cause your heart to go, ooh, yeah. But does he concede a lot of goals? Uh, no. You know, so he's, he's part of the best defence in Scotland. Mm -hmm. so he must be doing something right. And again, he's getting used to playing beside Cameron Carter Vickers and the two of them are forming a right decent partnership. Yeah. And I, I actually think that if you were to start, you know, uh, Julian has to come back and play at some point. But I think for the foreseeable future and, and during this run in, those three, as you say, Hart, Cameron, Cameron Carter Vickers and Carol Starfield pick themselves, unless injury make, makes one of them leave the team, because I'd be loath to break that defensive partnership up just as the two of them are hitting top for them, hitting their stride and looking like a partnership that you can trust. And I, I, and I think, and I've been critical of Starfield in the past, I, I, I admit that, but I'm taking it on a game-by-game -game basis. Mm -hmm. And in the last few game-by-game -game basis then, I don't think Starfield's done anything particularly wrong. He, alongside the, his partner, and I think the two of them now trust each other, 
pretty implicitly, and you can see that. You know, somebody's picking up the main centre forward, the other one drops. You know, and they, and they they rotate as well. They just say, right, I'll pick them up. You know, when when they were at Tyne Castle, they both took turns of uh, taking going head to head with Boyce. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can see that you can watch the two of them. You just kind of now and again, right? Is it your side pick them up? or I'll get them or whatever. So there's communication there, and I think the two of them are beginning to understand each other a hell of a lot better than they were earlier in the season and that. And it ain't broke. And as for Julian, then, will he get some game time at Wraith? As Amy said, it's 30th of December. I think he played game that one last game on the United last year. That's approaching, what, 14 months? Yeah, yeah. So he, you have to say that is there some underlying problem that moving ahead that Julian that we don't know about? Or is he going to get some game time? Because he has to start playing. He does, Tony. He definitely does. And I, I just, I would have expected him to, you know, the appearances to start bleeding in maybe 10, 15 minutes yesterday, for example, would have been a good start, but he's not there. Hopefully he reappears on Wednesday night. Uh, we've got, a little comment coming in from Twitch, Snick67. We register Julian for Europe. So he must be in some sort of contention. Well, I think, um, like what Amy says, you know, it's another quality addition. Uh, we just want to see him starting to creep back into the squads and get some appearances under his belt. Now, you mentioned earlier on, Amy, about Yakamakis. And uh, also, we could kind of feed this into the impact of Maeda uh, yesterday with his chipped goal, can we call it a chip? <laughs> what a chip it was. Um, he harasses, Maeda harasses everybody on the back line. I mean, he's going to be a nightmare for any back line. He's down the throats of goalkeepers. The pace that he has is frightening. Yakamakis gives you something completely different. Um, I think he enjoys the rough and tumble of Scottish football. He was looking at the referee yesterday a couple of times, um, so he's obviously getting used to some of the decisions are going to go against him because he's so physical, Amy. But there are a lot of games where you need that physicality. Um, He was involved in one of the the moves that led to the goal. He took on a Motherwell player with a a bit of panache, actually. You know, he chipped it over him, ran up the wing. Um, But the question again remains, you know, you would expect on Wednesday night for Jota to start uh, which then begs the question, who do you play through the middle? Uh, Patodre, Wednesday night, Amy, it's your call. Is it Maeda or Yakamakis and why? It's just not fair. Um, I would I'd go with Yakamakis. I would. Um, I think he put in a hell of a shift yesterday. I think he offers something totally different to what you know any other striker that Celtic does. He backs in, uses his physicality so well. I thought he was pretty hard done by with the the getting picking up a booking for um, that incident shove, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I would I would test Aberdeen backline who are really really weak, really struggling. Aberdeen are in a, a bit of a free fall right now. You know it's a, f- a few shocking results. Um, so yeah, I would have Yakamakis. Maeda can come on when they're they're tiring and can just run ragged. Um, but I think yeah, I think for me Yakamakis starts this one because I think he has a confidence player as well. Um, and he put in a real shift yesterday, like a proper shift. I was really, really impressed by him. He uh, created a lot of space, linked up well, and I just like the way that he uses his upper body strength. Um, and it's just that totally different avenue that Celtic can go down with him that no other striker, you know, Maiden and Kyogo, they're both so quick, can get the beating of players, um, and they, they pick up little pockets um, all, all over the park. But Yakimik... Yakimaka, sorry, he's a big target man, offers something different. Um not not like route one, but I just I like what he can do. And it's it's making Celtic a an unknown quantity in that sense. You know, are you going to get the nifty, you know, like say Maeda and Yota and Abad all linking up, or are you going to get Yakimaka who can just take the ball in back into defenders? You know, and he's he's up for a fight and I like that as well. What about yourself, Tony? I mean I, I do think he'll start with Yakamakis, and I think that he'll do what what he's done in the last two games, and that he'll harass and bother the defence probably for 60, 65, uh, with the view to bringing on Maeda with all that energy for the the closing stages of the game. Do you think that's the way to go, at Patodre? I would say we start with Yakamakis. If Rodrik starts, he'll start with the same team that started at Fir Hill, and then if he brings on O'Reilly, then he'll bring on Maeda because I think. O'Reilly's 
twitched on enough to be able to play Maida through uh, on goal with those kind of passes that Amy was highlighted earlier. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I think the problem with Jack and Marcus is Jack and Marcus is doing everything else in his game to perfection except hit the target, isn't he? I know. Score. He's hit the target. I mean, score. He's been up against like three goalkeepers who played out their skin and see Grease McGregor and Kelly yesterday and he must wonder what he has to do and he, you can see him getting frustrated and then trying a bit too hard. But everything else he's doing is great. He's leading the line well. He's creating space for others. You know, he's holding it up, laying it off. You know, and you just... Again, I get back to it. Sometimes with strikers, and you just need to relax and let it flow a wee bit. You know, and, and a couple of times he's maybe, you know, snatched at things and made good connection, but hit them straight at the goalkeeper. Whereas either side, culture finish, you're scoring. So you just has to breathe a wee bit because I say everything else, the the, the sum of the parts are there, the nuts and bolts are there of a, of a good footballer. It's just marrying them all together and producing mm-hmm. the performance. You know, he, he's goal at Tyne Castle, that one touch finish, that instinctive thing. Not much time to think. Just do it. You know, so he can produce those moments. He just has to... I don't know. He, I thought he played well yesterday too. But again... I think, like him, I think he said it himself that he's yeah, he's got a big ego, so he'll probably judge himself on his own goal scoring performance, you know. So you probably that's how you see him getting a bit frustrated. But yeah. I like the look of him; he's a handful. <clears throat> he has something different, and uh, you know he, he maybe doesn't like the the guile of a Maeda or a Kyogo, but that's that's fine because you Angie's very much a a horses for courses manager, isn't he? And going to put on a Wednesday night, you're going to have to dig deep to get a result. So, yeah, he, he's probably the guy who might get you that result in that kind of game. So, I would, I would persevere with him because I think he's he's worth persevering with. And then if you get yourself in front in the later stages, you can maybe bring on Maeda to stretch them. As long as you've got somebody like O'Reilly and Hatati still on the part, and well, possibly Rogic to play the, the kind of through balls that Maeda feeds off. You know, I'm not going to say Maeda's was a was a great finish yesterday because he he just got it's, some it's great chip. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, but the through ball was worth uh, mentioning. You know, so oh, it definitely it. was. Loads of comments coming in about Julian. Uh, Kevin fourteen was Julian part of the clique? Uh, I'm starting to wonder. And will McMillan, if it, Julian is a different class than Starfelt, I think that's a good debate to have. Will because I mean I, I was a fan of Julian. Uh, you know, I think that there was a period of time, particularly after the Rugby Park draw last season, where him and Ayer came in for a bit of flack. We needed a centre half. We brought in Shane Duffy, um, and obviously, uh, you know, the fact that he's been away, a lot of Celtic fans are, are remembering his best performances. There, there were some bad performances, but we'll see if he comes back in. Julian, a threat at corner, something we are missing. Uh, another point from JP and Julian maybe comes in for the last thirty minutes versus Wraith. Uh, which I think would be a good way to try and bed them into the into the team. When we're looking at the the fullback situations, because we're talking about the centre halves here and all the other options around the park. When you look at the fullback situation, um, we, we've got a player in Juranovic, Amy, that allows us to run with what we have. And, and I think that you know, given the perfect set of circumstances, Ange probably would have brought in another left back. But we've got too many at the club. I mean, you, you probably need to stay offload ball and golly before he brings in another. But what we've seen is a situation where, yes, Ralston's dropped out, Sharanovic has dropped out. Taylor in the last two games, I think, has played brilliantly. I think he's been absolutely tremendous at left back and also offensively. So we're now in a situation where we're almost juggling with three players for the, the two full back positions. And you've got Scales as backup as well. Taylor has come through a lot of criticism. At Celtic, are we finally starting to see the Greg Taylor that we bought um, as this young Scottish prospect from Kilmarnock a, a few years back? I swear to God, and I will take a screenshot to prove it, I think it's for been 18 months now I've been in a group chat called Greg Taylor Fan Club. So, <laughs> fullbacks are obviously... How many fan knowledge. club group chats? How I many know, of these are you in? I'm clearly, I can catch a, a fullback. I've got a good eye for them. No, I'm delighted to see him doing so well. Um, the kind of you know, swagger that I'm talking about with Yakimakis. I think Taylor's had it in abundance these last few games. I don't know what's 
going on, but he's he's just got. I think it's it started at Tide Castle really had that little bit of an edge, so happy to get in players' faces. But he's just you know he's really fighting for the cause right now, um, and I love it. He's got like I say, just leaving that little bit, and I I really do I really do like it. But yeah, he is. Um, he has been the whipping boy for so long, and I know for so many that he is still perhaps a weak link. But you know, he is going to give you a seven out of ten every single week, and I'm not saying that a seven out of ten is what you should only be settling for at Celtic. But you know, sometimes there's there's going to be eights and nines, but consistently he is a seven, and consistently it's a hundred and ten percent. And I think the trust that Andrew's really put in him, you know, for for the uh, for this season, it's really now starting to come to fruition. And he is, he's linking up so well, he's getting forward, he's defending well, everything is clicking. So for me, um, yeah, I, I am delighted for him. And I do think, well, it's, it's evident that he's a, the first choice left back. Um, and he does have a little bit of competition. I think Liam Scales, when he's came in, has been really, really impressive. Maybe that's played a little bit in his mind as well, that, you know, he's not, you know, for, for such a long time, he kind of was really the only left back that, the, the club would really put out um, every, everyone else was well you know we, we all know what happened so um, Juranovic is now you know he is going to be the right back he is poor, poor Tony but um, yeah I think with Liam Scales the emergence and just kind of you know the, the fleeting p- p- performances and appearances and the, the shifts that he's put in maybe it has gave Taylor a little bit of a kick as well um, Well Amy did you set that fan club up after his tackle against Joey Barton for Kilmarnock? Was it pre-Celtic? I don't, I don't know why it came about. that we Because the, the name of the group did change to that. Um, because I think we're, at the time we were the only Greg Taylor fans in the country. Um, but I, And I'm the only Celtic fan in it as well, though. So, um, yeah, there's a love affair. <laughs> Brilliant. Tony, what's your take on Greg Taylor? He, he's coming for some stick. We're getting some comments coming in here. Taylor plays Celtic win. It's that simple. And Brian Walsh reckons that uh, he won't let us down domestically, but he is limited. What's your thoughts on Taylor? He certainly deserves a jersey right now, doesn't he? The manager trusted him, and the manager trusted him when he came back from injury in the biggest game of the season. Up till then, that was the League Cup final. It's like you knew where the manager's thoughts were. Mm-hmm. He uh, saw Taylor as the first choice left back and Juranovic as the first choice right back, regardless of the clamour for Ralston round about that time. Uh, so um, I'd like to think that the manager, well, the man, I'll, I'll state for a fact, the manager certainly knows a lot more about football than me, so I'll go along with his judgment. And uh, I don't think Taylor has let the manager down since the League Cup final. And his last two performances in particular have been, uh, yeah, worthy of the jersey and then some. Uh, yeah. Really had a terrific game against Rangers and uh, cemented that on Sunday against Motherwell for part where you, you're now seeing the, the kind of real Greg Taylor. Yeah, just as regarding Taylor, of course. That, that's it, isn't it? And I, uh, yeah, you know, you can find fault in every player and pick out their weaknesses and their limitations. You know, that's, that's what we do and they come to the fore whenever they, they make mistakes and stuff. But again, like you touched upon a bad I think Greg Taylor's had a purple patch in his Celtic career and he is doing the job and he's not letting MD down. And I get back to it, his contribution for the, the first goal on Sunday, it just opened everything up. Mm-hmm. He just had to look up and execute the pass into a badder. But it was Taylor that opened up all that space. I mean, took about four players out. And it was it was just a, a brilliant bit of skill, but just quick thinking too. Somebody who switched on and knew the knew how quick to play the pass and just you know uh, get the ball rolling for for the first goal. And you know if you're making contributions like that, I like to keep them clean sheets at the back. Then how can MD find fault? You know, and in, in, in what you're doing. So I I'm with Amy on this one. Maybe not at the Greg Taylor fan club stage, but. My, you know, my fandom is growing, as they say, towards him, uh, and and long may that continue. Right, so he's now waiting for his invite to the WhatsApp group, Amy. We're looking forward <laughs> to the Aberdeen game on Wednesday night. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, once again 
on this uh, Monday bulletin where you've been tuning in 1200 strong live. Thanks everybody for supporting the Celtic State of Mind. You've been watching on all the socials and also on YouTube. If you are watching on the YouTube channel, get subscribing. We've got some big content coming your way and everything we do is free of charge, of course. All that's left for me to say is thank you again, Amy Canavan and Tony Haggerty for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>